Welcome to week two of Climate Change, How Safe Are You? Um, my name's Arna Mortz. I don't know if I introduced myself last week. I was so excited. And I'm just as, just as excited um, today. So we have five talks in this part of the series, and we'll have at least two more uh, in the fall. And next week, we'll move back into the big room, the big warm room, for those of you who were there uh, last week. And uh, yeah, so I was so excited um, meeting Navin that I didn't even get a chance to organize my um, introduction. But we were, we were very excited to uh, have Dr. Raman Kuti come and speak. He, we actually identified him as a potential speaker be, when he was at McGill, because he just moved from McGill to uh, UBC this summer. And uh, his, who he is, so I talked about Carl Lowenberger um, last week, uh, and said that he was one of these Canada Research Chairs, the, that program that brought people to Canada, um, able people from the States. And uh, Ravin is another one of these Canada Research Chairs. And he is the Canada Research Chair in Global Environmental Change and Food Security at the Liu Institute uh, at UBC. So there isn't a better fit between what he gets paid to do and what we were trying to achieve by, by um, arranging, creating um, this series. So he got, uh, he hails from southern India and he actually has an engineering degree um, from the PSG school uh, in Tamil Nadu. He then, he said he then started to move north, so he went to um, Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. Uh, he then went to the University of Wisconsin, which where Carl Lohenberger was as well. And then he went to McGill, and it turns out Vancouver is farther north than Montreal, he tells me. He is a, he is a geographer, so he, um, and an engineer, so uh, he should know. Um, he gave me a CV, and it's got like 12 pages of, of things. He is an author on the, one of the IPCC fourth report, um, he is now a Leopold Fellow, which is a, a program that they only choose about 20 people a year, um, and train them in applying science to policy. I think that's probably the right thing. And, and so um, he'll be starting that uh, in now, next year, this year, I guess, or in the fall. Um, he's been a NASA Fellow. Uh, he has uh, won a whole bunch of things. I'm not even going to tell you all these things that he's won, because I think the most important thing is that He's going to talk about food security, and there's probably nobody in North America that knows more about food security and climate change than Dr. Nevin Raman Kuti. So please welcome him with me. Thanks, Tom, for the flattering introduction. There are tons of people in North America working on climate change and food. I'm not the only one. Uh, but I hope to give you uh, my perspective on the topic today. Um, let me start by showing you a chart of uh, human population growth over the last 10,000 years. Um, you all seen this graph. Um, historians talk about uh, three main drivers of this change over the last uh, 10,000 years. The first is uh, fire, um, our ability to uh, harness fire, our ability to cook with it. And the first evidence, that people keep finding first evidence of fire further and further back in time. Uh, but currently, it's believed that uh, people cooked with fire about a million years ago. There's evidence of, uh, you know, uh, cooking um, in, I think it's in Africa. So that was uh, a million years ago. The other big thing that happened was the um, development of sedentary agriculture, a, a ability to grow crops, which developed roughly 10,000 years ago. And more recently, um, our ability to harness energy from fossil fuels, um, the Industrial Revolution. So agriculture, among um, other things, has been a really important uh, aspect um, in the development of human civilizations. This is an animation showing just what's happened in the last 300 years. This, is, um, this shows the expansion of uh, croplands, places where we, use, uh, where we grow crops. Um, it starts in 1700, and you see that most of the kind of large-scale agriculture in 1700s, um, yes? I hope this is turned on. Can you hear? Should I just move it up? Can someone at the back tell me if it's working now? Is there a volume? There. It should be working. Is it working now for the people at the back? 
Not, uh, no. Give me one second. Okay. No contraption up here. <laughs> he, he, he asked me to give him a second, so. Okay. <laughs> Leave you in suspense. <laughs> I did. It's not loud enough. You can hear it, but it's right here. So this the speakers back there. Can you hear something in the speakers back there? Yeah. It's just not loud enough. That's better. I'll have to hold it in front of my mouth. <laughs> I can do that until he comes. So, <laughs> um, so this shows an animation of, uh, of croplands expanding over the last 300 years. Um, most of the large scale cultivation was in the old world. And as you see this animation, you'll see the influence of human settlements. So essentially, um, the, the big changes were essentially European settlements in North America, in the Americas. And you'll also see expansion in other parts of the world as well. In the 1700s, settlement first along the eastern seaboards of North America. <coughs> Nothing yet in Australia, that's right, but there you go. <laughs> in the 1900s in Argentina. And in the last 50 years in both Southeast Asia as well as South America. So just in the last 300 years, that's been a tremendous you know, conversion of natural vegetation for growing crops. And if you look at the status of agriculture today, this shows both um, croplands, places where we grow crops in green color, and grazing lands or pastures where we have animals um, in the brownish colors. So the first thing you'll notice is that most of the world where we are able to grow crops today, or places that are suitable for um, agriculture in terms of climate and soils, we are already using them for growing crops. Um, a third of the world's land surface, if you exclude Greenland and Antarctica, are in agriculture today, either used for growing crops or raising our animals. When you open an atlas of the world and you see uh, maps of land cover, you typically see things like forests. You see biomes, and you will see forest biomes and grasslands and uh, shrublands and so on. But today, agriculture is the largest biome on the planet, right? For, uh, followed by crop, uh, forest land and grassland. So our human activities, one single species, has transformed the entire planet's land surface and made it the single largest biome just to feed us. But that's only part of the story. The real story also, especially over the last 30 years, um, and w this is mainly because of, of, of uh, our ability to harness energy from the Industrial Revolution, is that of intensification. We are able to now grow more and more food on the land we have today. Um, we are able to intensify our production systems. And we have these men to thank for that. Um, it's typically called the Green Revolution. Uh, the, um, it's, it's the intensification of agriculture, especially as applied in Latin America and Asia. Um, Gregor Mendel, going back to the 19th century, uh, first, uh, his, people probably remember his experiments with peas. Um, he essentially laid the foundation for uh, plant breeding as we know it. Uh, Fritz Haber was a German, um, and he was the first person to figure out how to get nitrogen um, how to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. We have plenty of nitrogen in the atmosphere. 70% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Uh, but it's really hard to get it into a form that plants can use. And Fritz Harber was the first person to, uh, to uh, be able to convert nitrogen into ammonia. Um, and he, it's called the Harber-Bosch process because Bosch was the one who um, was able to take, to take the technology and make it in, um, in, into an industrial scale. And then finally, we have Norman Borlaug. People know Norman Borlaug? So he's considered the father of the Green Revolution. Um, and he's essentially responsible for kind of, uh, developing the new uh, varieties of uh, crops as we know it. Um, so hybrid corn, hybrid wheat, and so on. 
Uh, Norman Borlaug was responsible for developing hybrid wheat, which produces very high yields um, when you also add uh, a lot of inputs with nitrogen and fertilizer use and so on. And he was re responsible for also taking the Green Revolution technologies to um, Asia. Um, he was invited by the Indian government. Uh, the Indian government was seeing a bunch of famines in the 60s. They heard about this technology that's available that was developed in Mexico. Uh, Norman Bola came over to kind of uh, to transfer the technologies. So this has been in some ways a tremendous success. Um, if you look at what's happened over the last 40 years, this shows population growth over the last 40 years. It's roughly doubled, but our food production actually more than kept pace with population growth. In fact, harvested area, the amount of land used for growing crops did not increase as much compared to food production. What actually happened over the last 30 years is irrigated areas doubled and fertilizer use quadrupled over the last 40 years. So there's two things that's been going on. On the one hand, we've been expanding land for agriculture over, and over the last 300 years. Today, a lot of that is going on in um, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, as well as in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia and so on. Uh, most of the lands here in North America were cleared in the 1800s. Um, so most of the changes now are happening in the tropics. In addition to that, we've also been intensifying our production, applying more irrigation, more fertilizer, along with new varieties of seeds to grow more food. This has been a, this has had uh, multiple outcomes. The number of calories per person has increased over the last 40 years, uh, was roughly just over 2,000 calories per person. Today, on, in the, on the planet, on average, we have 2,800 kilocalories per person per day. Right? More than enough. If you look at dietary guidelines, they roughly say you need about 2,000 calories per person. So we produce enough food on the planet today for the 7 billion people we have. Another way to look at it is, is that populations increased from about 5 billion to 7 billion over the last 40 years. At the same time, the number of undernourished people, as estimated by the Food and Agricultural Organization, decreased from about a billion people to 800 million people today. So yes, we have 800 million people today, but we actually managed to feed more people. I'm sorry about that. We actually managed to feed more people over the last 40 years in spite of population growth. So agriculture is a big deal. You can say that it feeds 6 billion people today. Um, it uh, provides livelihood for about a third of the people on the planet, and especially the poor. It provides livelihood for about three quarters of the poor. And in Africa, two thirds of the workforce is uh, dependent on agriculture, and a third of the GDP is dependent on agriculture. So it's really important for people, it's important for nations. So we can argue that agriculture has been the foundation of human civilizations as we know it. But there's still a huge number of challenges remaining. The food security challenge, the, our ability to feed people has not gone away. Um, as I said, there are about 800 million people today who are still undernourished, and most of them live in Africa and parts of Asia. Uh, very high degrees of undernourishment, about 35% and above in some countries in Africa. And at the same time, uh, several people estimate that we'll need more food in the future. Uh, for one thing, population growth. Uh, we are expected to uh, hit 9 to 10 billion people by 2050. Um, a recent study, in fact, says that that's an underestimate, that we'll have populations of up to 12 billion by the end of the century, that it's not actually going to taper off. Um, at the same time, uh, our consumption is increasing. Uh, people are increase eating more and more, especially more um, meat-intensive diets. And put together, there's an estimate that we need about twice the food by 2050. And if the new population growth estimates are true, we'll need even more food. At the same time, we also have looming global environmental changes. Uh, agriculture itself is one of the major global environmental um, drivers on the planet today. If you take biodiversity loss um, and you ask, we, we all know about biodiversity loss on the planet, species extinctions, and if we ask what's the biggest driver of biodiversity, biodiversity loss on the planet, it's agriculture. Um, especially for birds, which is a species that we know very well about. 60% of the threats 
to bird biodiversity comes from agriculture, especially because of uh, habitat fragmentation around the planet as we cut down forests and fragment landscapes. Um, critical species don't have the habitats to persist in. In terms of water use, this is an image of the RLC um, from 1987 to 2009. Um, the RLC has greatly diminished over time, and this is mainly because of uh, irrigation for cotton. The rivers that feed the RLC, people have been withdrawing water from it for irrigating cotton for the t-shirts that we wear, right? Um, and this has essentially caused the RLC to disappear over a 40-year period. Um, nearly 70% of the global withdrawal of water um, is for agriculture purposes. So we can save as much water as we want in our households by turning off the tap while we are brushing our teeth, uh, but the way we eat will have a huge impact on water resources. And then finally, water pollution as well. This is an image of uh, eutrophication, um, algal blooms in lakes and coastal wetlands. Plants love nitrogen, all plants love nitrogen, so do aquatic plants, um, so algae love nitrogen too. Um, as we apply more and more nitrogen on our agricultural soils, the plants take it up, the crops take it up, they grow bigger, but the crops don't take all of it up. A bunch of the nutrients get, get left behind in the soils. They either get washed off or they get eroded off the landscape. They finally get into groundwater and surface water. Um, the classic one is the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia, where uh, the intensive farming in Iowa um, and the, the Midwestern US in general um, the nitrogen that comes off there, it runs down the Mississippi River, reaches the Gulf of Mexico, and causes these huge algal blooms. And when these algae decompose and die, they remove oxygen from the water and create these no oxygen zones, essentially called dead zones. And uh, periodically in the summer, they have fish kills off the Gulf of Mexico because of these dead zones. Related to agriculture, many, many much further away from the Midwestern US. And then there's the issue of climate change itself. Um, when we think about climate change, we typically think about driving cars, we think about heating buildings, um, but deforestation for agriculture is responsible for carbon dioxide emissions as well and causing climate change. Our livestock, uh, the, our life, uh, livestock uh, production as well as rice paddy production um, results in methane emissions. Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas and also results in climate change. Our use of fertilizers um, results in release of nitrous oxide, which is a, also a really powerful greenhouse gas, more powerful than both CO2 and methane. And together, people estimate that uh, between 20 and 30 percent of our total impact on climate change is because of deforestation and our agricultural practices. So when we think about climate change itself, a third, the contribution comes from agriculture. So agriculture has an impact on climate. On in turn, climate change might have an impact on agriculture as well. So we have a huge number of global challenges. So I'd like to think of it as the food quadrilemma. On the one hand, we have 800 million people hungry today and we need to feed them. On top of that, we may need more food as the population increases and more and more people are increasing their consumption. Agriculture itself is a huge driver of global environmental problems, and then in turn, climate change may in turn come back and bite us in the back. It might impact agriculture as well. So there's several challenges. My, the remit of my talk today is to talk about the last one. How will climate change impact food security around the planet? So, um, the reason I give you this kind of overview is to say that climate change is not the only problem in town in thinking about food. Um, it is an important problem, but we need to consider it in the context of other global environment, other global changes as well. So how do we determine the impact of climate change on um, agriculture? Today my talk will focus only on crops. I'm not going to talk about livestock. I'm not going to talk about fisheries. Um, that will take two hours. and <laughs> You don't have that time. So let's go back to the basics to try to understand this. What do plants need? So we can go back to photosynthesis and throw out an equation. Maybe this is, have people shown equations before? <laughs> I know I'm told in talks never to show equations. <laughs> so this is a simple photosynthesis equation you may remember from biology classes in high school. 
but it's very simple. Uh, plants need carbon dioxide. Uh, that's pretty obvious. If you go to a greenhouse, you'll see that sometimes people pump carbon dioxide into greenhouses and plants grow bigger. Plants need water. That's the second one, H2O. Sorry, this is carbon dioxide, H2O, water. Plants need water. If you haven't watered your house plants, you know that they don't do so well. Plants need light. They need energy from light. Um, if you keep your house plants in a shady environment, you know that they don't do so well. So in the presence of light or energy from light, photons from, sorry about that, uh, plants essentially fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the presence of water and form carbohydrates, starch, that's the stuff we eat, and they release oxygen as a byproduct. That's a simple photosynthesis equation. And the rate of this chemical reaction is also determined by temperature, um, as well as how uh, the leaves have enzymes, how they, how they function is determined by temperature. Plants are amazing things, right? Not many people can fix carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Right? So another important thing to keep in mind is that there are two kinds of plants. Uh, there are actually three kinds, but majority, majority of the world's plants are either C3 or C4, but 95% of the world's plants are C3 plants. Uh, wheat is a good crop. That's an example of C3. And corn is a C4 plant. Um, so corn, sugarcane, and sorghum are the only crops that are C4 plants. If you change CO2 in the atmosphere, this is how these, the photosynthesis of these two plants respond. Wheat will respond in this way, while uh, corn will respond in this way. Current carbon dioxide concentrations are somewhere up here. Um, the reason is that the C4 plants have developed a mechanism for um, being very efficient with CO2. So they are doing really well even at current levels of carbon dioxide concentrations. So if you increase the carbon dioxide for C4 plants like corn, um, its photosynthesis is not going to respond very much. It's not going to change very much. C3 plants, on the other hand, uh, will respond. So increasing CO2 will be beneficial to C3 plants. Okay. Similarly, if you look at how the temperature responses, all plants have an optimum temperature range. It's different for C3 and C floors, but if it's too cold or if it's too hot, plants don't like it. Okay, so that's basic uh, plant physiology. You can put this all together and make some kind of broad conclusions, right? Um, increased CO2 concentration is actually good for C3 plants. Um, so wheat will respond very well, maize won't. Um, a whole bunch of climate skeptics have actually used this fact to say that climate change is good for us, right? Um, you, you've probably seen that. <laughs> but yes, it is partly true, but that's not the whole story. Uh, plants like an optimum temperature range. Um, if you live in cold climates like Canada, uh, we may end up seeing longer growing seasons. We're already seeing longer growing seasons. And this may actually be good for agriculture. A warmer world will, may also have increased water stress. So warming has a direct impact on plant physiology. As I said, it might, uh, you know, enzymes may denature. Um, plants may, um, may not like high temperatures. But as you have higher temperatures, you, ha you also have greater evaporation from the land surface. And the amount of soil moisture, the amount of water in the soil is a balance between how much rain is coming down and how much evaporation happens. And so the increased evaporation is going to dry out the soils and may cause more water stress in plants. Finally, there's a really important influence of uh, indirect effects. Plants are not the only things that are, you know, yes, we try to make sure that plants are the only things, crops are the only things growing on our farmlands, but there are also pests and diseases and weeds that we also always have to deal with. So how these things will change um, is still not very well understood. Um, the latest uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, uh, in their assessment um, says that we, they think that weeds will actually do really well under climate change. So we have a challenge in the sense, yes, we, we have to look at the crops, we, but we also have to think about how weeds might respond. And weeds, by the way, are C4 crops, and they do really well under higher temperatures, even if they don't respond to CO2. So how do scientists assess how climate change will uh, influence crops. So we know these basics. We know plant physiology. We know the principles, the basic principles. Then we use models. Um, we can talk about these basic principles, but then if you want to know how climate change in Africa will affect maize in particular, you need to know a lot more than that. So scientists use models. Um, there are several kinds of models. Broadly, they can be classified in the, into these three kinds. There are these detailed farm level models. So Scientists have developed these models in particular farms in Iowa or 
Wisconsin or somewhere else in Africa, let's say. Um, and they've calibrated the model to work very well in that particular farm, and then they try to apply the same models in other parts of the world. On the other hand, there are these global crop models, and I, I work with those kinds of models. Um, these are models that, are, that use more generalizable <coughs> principles, and you can do simulations of the entire world at the same time. But the models are fairly simple. You can have the details that you have in the farm level models, uh, but they use more general principles, and you can compare how different parts of the world might uh, respond differently. And then finally, um, just in the last 10 years or so, uh, several kind of uh, clever scholars um, have developed more statistical models saying, hey, okay, we can do, look at all these detailed crop models, but we have data from the past on how crop yields have changed. We have data from the past on climate. Can we put them together just in a statistical basis to see uh, what's going on? So I'm going to kind of uh, give you a few examples of things we know today uh, from these kinds of models on how climate change may influence crops. So the first question to ask is how has climate changed recently, right? So one study by David LaBelle and colleagues from Stanford um, looked at the period from 1980 to 2008, so roughly about, uh, a 30 year period. And this graph shows the total amount of warming, all the red places are warming, the blue places are cooling off. Um, uh, don't worry about the units there. Um, it shows the total amount of warming over the last decade during the growing season for the four major crops. So it's for maize, wheat, soy, and rice, okay? Um, so because you need to think about the growing season too. If the climate warms in a period when the crops are not growing, it doesn't matter, right? What you find predominantly is a huge amount of warming in many parts of the world. The brightest red part says that the amount of warming is three times the standard deviation over the last 30 years. So the amount of warming is three times greater than the fluctuation, the inherent fluctuation over the last 30 years. So that's a huge amount of warming. What about rainfall? It's a much more mixed story. And if you uh, follow the climate change literature, you'll know that it's really, really challenging to predict how rainfall will change. Different models will do different things. And over the last 30 years, the actual data shows that in some places we've had decreased rainfall, and other places we've had increased rainfall. It's kind of spotty, okay? Can I clip it now? Does that still work for the people in the back? Thank you. So what the statistical models have done, what David LaBelle and his colleagues did at Stanford was to say, okay, we know how climate has changed over the last 30 years. We have yield data from put in agricultural organization and essentially reported yields from different countries. Let's develop statistical models to look at the relationship between these two. Um, are there any relationship? When temperature goes up, does yield go up or down? When rainfall goes up, does yield go up or down? And you can look at that relationship and then try to estimate what happened over the last 30 years. And this is, so based on that, they've estimated the yield losses from past climate change uh, for maize, wheat, rice, and soy. And what they found is large yield losses, up to four to 5% yield losses over the last 30 years for maize and wheat. Rice seems to have had very little influence and soy is quite small as well. So these are just based on statistical models. Then you can ask, okay, which of the two variables, temperature or rainfall, caused the yield loss? Well, first of all, you know that temperature has increased a lot. And so when you ask that question, it turns out that temperature has contributed to most of the yield loss, both for maize and wheat. Rice, in fact, temperature seems to have benefited rice um, over the last 30 years. Rainfall is the one that caused it to be negative, while soy about roughly half and half comes from temperature and rainfall. They can, you can ask, okay, which countries have been most affected? Um, so these are just looking at the major producers of each of these crops. Um, Russia, over the last 30 years, has had a 14% decrease in production because of the climate change that's already happened. So we're not, now we are not talking about future climate change, okay? We are talking about things that have already happened in the last 30 years. And I'm sure if you read the news, you've often heard about fires in Russia, drought in Russia. Well, that's had an impact. This is, the data is showing that impact. Um, rice, I said, actually benefited. Turns out that in China, rice actually benefited from climate change. So climate change is not necessarily a bad thing everywhere. Some places you may actually benefit. And there's a, it's a complicated story because rice is very different from other crops. Rice seems to respond more to 
minimum temperatures in the day during the day rather than the really high temperatures uh, because rice like f it flowers in the morning and so as minimum temperatures change they they respond to that so in, in sum, summarizing that study, we had about a four to five and a half percent decreases um, in production of maize and wheat just during the last 30 years. This is not even looking into the far into the future. But are these are kind of assuming, oh, we'll have a certain percentage change. Are these changes going to be gradual? So you no, know, over 30 years, we'll have three, three and a half percent. Next 30 years, we'll have another three and a half percent. Is that just going to be linear or not? Recent studies showed that it's not going to be linear. Um, this is an extremely clever statistical study looking at just the U.S. And uh, don't worry about the different curves. Um, there are just different kinds of models that they used to fit. They tried three different models. All of them show pretty much the same thing. Um, this shows maize yield and how it changes uh, with temperature. So as you go to higher and higher temperatures in a warmer world, it turns out that the probability that you have um, extreme high temperature days will increase. So if you go from, say, 29 degrees to 30 degrees, that's a one degree change in the average temperature, but your exposure to extreme high temperatures, because you have daily fluctuations in temperature, one day is not the same as the next, we know that, right? Um, your exposure to extreme high temperatures increases even faster, so there's a non-linearity in average temperature and extreme temperature. That result turns into this huge loss in yields as you go over an average temperature of something like 29 degrees Celsius for, cotton, for corn. They found the same result for soy, uh, for soy and cotton. For soy, the threshold was 30 degrees. For cotton, the threshold was 32. Cotton is a uh, crop that likes warmer climates, right? Uh, what impact does this make? Uh, so this is a result from their models. They're looking at corn, soy, and cotton here. These are a bunch of different scenarios of how the future climate may change. Um, all of these are looking at estimated impacts using this kind of model to by the end of the century. So it's looking at 2070 to 2099. Um, the green ones that you can't really see here, but these are what you would predict for yield change if you just use the linear models like I told you before. The blues and reds are what you would predict if you use the nonlinear models. So the statistical models now are getting better. People are saying we can't just build linear models. We have to look at the nonlinearity in these changes. And now we are seeing potential changes from 40 to 80% by the end of the century in crop uh, production losses. So yes, large negative response beyond 30 to 34 degrees centigrade. And changes depending on the region and the crop. OK. Can farmers do something about this? We, we seem to have major changes coming down the line, um, but farmers are not passive. Um, they don't, they, they will, they'll change their practices. Um, so we, they, they can adapt to climate change. Uh, how much potential do we, do we have to adapt? Uh, one of my master's students uh, addressed that question. Um, so we, we work with these global crop models, and so this is a global simulation of maize yields. This is a percentage change in maize yields, reddish, Reddish colors show decreases. Um, if you do a simulation where farmers are passive, they don't do anything, um, maize yields pretty much decrease in most of the world. But then we did a simulation where we allowed farmers to adapt. Um, essentially, we said farmers are able to change their planting dates so they can sow earlier if you have longer growing seasons. They can also change their cultivars so they can plant a crop that fits your new, if your growing season is longer, you can plant a cultivar that you know, fits that new growing season. So when we did those two changes, we suddenly see some greens, especially in the temperate regions. So in the colder parts of the world, with farmer adaptation, crop yields may actually increase instead of decreasing. Okay, so you, adaptation has, uh, I mean, some, some people critiqued our study by saying this is kind of maximum adaptation. This is the best thing you could see. Uh, but still, you, you can see that there is a, a, a big impact. And so if you, if you estimate how much maize, soy, and spring wheat yields may decrease, this is percentage loss in yield by 2050, um, you'll see by 2050, 25 to maybe 20 to 25 percent decrease in yields. But then if you include adaptation, um, that offsets a lot of the losses. So uh, farmers can do something about it. This is uh, a summary of a whole bunch of studies from the recent IPCC report. So they did an assessment and they looked, in this case, you have 45 studies, those show the number of studies. Um, and this is a percentage change in tropical wheat yields. So I'm just showing you a couple of examples. 
So in tropical wheat, as temperatures increase, so different studies have used different temperature changes, as you go from one to two to three to four to five degrees Celsius, there's progressively greater and greater losses of yield by maybe 50%. This is the red, the red line is with no adaptation, the blue line is including adaptation if farmers do something about it. On the other hand, you look at temperate wheat, it does much better. You have decreases in yield, but much lower than that. And with adaptation, in fact, you can actually see increases in yield. If I summarize all that, um, and this is also a summary from the IPCC, the wheat and maize are mostly affected, especially in the tropics. CO2 increase will benefit crops. I didn't show you studies showing this, but especially wheat will benefit, but maybe not maize as much. There's a large kind of negative sensitivity, a kind of nonlinear change beyond around 30 degrees Celsius. Adaptation, um, the IPCC estimates that adaptation improves yields in general by about 15 to 18%. So you'll have yield losses, but about 15 to 18% of the yield loss could be uh, offset if farmers adapt, but especially in temperate regions. So who's causing climate change? Predominantly, the causes, people who are causing climate change live in the temperate regions. Um, it's US, Europe, um, and now China, India as well. Uh, people who are going to be most affected by climate change are in the tropics. People are not the cause of the problem. People who are able to adapt to it are back in the temperate re regions. So the people who are going to be, people who are causing the problem will be, potentially be able to adapt to it People who are not causing the problem have very little adaptation capacity. Just, this is not even from farmer capacity to adapt. This is just from how the system works in terms of uh, how the crops respond. So what kinds of adaptations are possible? Well, we could alter planting and harvest dates uh, and change cultivars, as I talked about. Um, could potentially expand into colder regions, again, um, that's only possible in the temperate regions of the world, uh, but there may also be contraction in the warmer regions at the same time. Uh, we may be able to optimize irrigation and fertilizer use. The IPCC assessed that this was not a big thing, but uh, it's possible that some of those changes could happen. Uh, in the future, maybe there will be uh, kind of development, improved development of uh, crops that are more heat and uh, drought tolerant. Okay, so I want to take you back to the food quadrilemma, right? So yes, climate change has a big impact um, and you know, temperate regions will be less affected, tropics will be more affected. Uh, but we need to think about the climate change problem, I think from a, from a kind of a broader food context. I think it's a mistake to focus solely on the climate food problem and not think about the bigger picture. This is a study from one of my colleagues at the uh, um, University of Minnesota. And what is, what is plotted here is uh, the changes in yield over the last uh, 40 years, 50 years, of maize, rice, wheat, and soybean. Um, so those are the actual data on how yields have changed over the last 40 years. Okay. The <coughs> solid lines here are essentially extensions of this yield change. Okay. So if yields continue to change in the future as they have in the past, so essentially, if we can keep up with the green revolution, um, that would, those would be the solid lines here. The da dotted lines show what is estimated to be needed if we have to double food production by 2050. So this is what you'll need to do. The gap is essentially what, what will be needed if you have to double food production compared to what we are doing today. So what we are doing today is nowhere near enough to match the estimated increase in food demand in the future. And on top of that, now we add the climate change impacts, right? This is continuing to do what we're doing. If you add climate change, those solid lines will come even further down. So it's in the context of this challenge of potentially needing more food in the future that we have to think about climate change. So we need to think about maybe broader solutions. And my colleagues and I uh, published a paper a few years ago trying to think about you know, what could be a way to look at some of the broader solutions to the food problem. One thing you have to think about is just to reduce agriculture's contribution to climate change itself. So if you're worried about climate change impacting agriculture, we may, be, we may want to start by thinking about the impact of agriculture on climate and reducing that contribution. In fact, in the more recent UNFCC debates, uh, 
this has gotten more attention and people are talking about, uh, you know, what are the different ways of reducing emissions from deforestation. So there are, in fact, the only thing all the countries agreed on in Copenhagen last time was uh, to, to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, we also need to think at the same time about potentially growing more food to meet the needs of today as well as the needs of tomorrow. And then finally, we also need to think about using the food we have today more wisely. So my colleagues and I published a study to say, to ask, or we did an analysis, a global analysis, to ask, you know, how can we do this? How can we achieve this? The first thing we said was we need to halt deforestation for food production. This graph, is, it's a simple graph. It shows uh, places in the world that have more carbon in ecosystems. Uh, if you're in the forest, it's mainly for the amount of forest carbon versus the amount of carbon that, that's in crops that are replacing those ecosystems. So the amount of places that are in brown have a lot of carbon, but not much crop yield. Okay, this is where most of the tropical deforestation is going on for growing crops. What kinds of crops are we growing there? Mostly soy, which goes to feed pigs in China, and oil palm, which uh, goes into a whole bunch of products, including chocolate. Right? Um, so we are not growing food. We are growing soy. We are, well, we're growing food in the form of pigs, and we are growing chocolate and a whole bunch of other products. Um, we are not really growing food in these places. So deforesting this area, the tropi tropical deforestation for growing these kinds of crops doesn't necessarily make sense. The second thing is if you want to, if you can't expand agriculture anymore, um, then we'll have to do, if you, and if you want to produce more food, we'll have to do it through intensification. And we'll need to do what people call closing yield gaps. Um, so this is an analysis where we calculated how, how, how do yields vary around the world um, and some of that difference is because of differences in climate, but some of the differences because of differences in management, how farmers manage the land. So we, we were able to do an analysis where we were able to normalize for the influence of climate and ask how much of the yield gap is purely because of different management practices. So all the places in green here have smaller yield gaps, um, North America, Western Europe, parts of India and China. Basically, farmers are doing as well as they could be. While a whole bunch of places in red, um, farmers could be doing better in terms of closing the yield gap. And we estimated that just closing the yield gap could increase the amount of calories available by about 60 to 30 to 60 percent. Of course, closing the yield gap means potentially adding more water, adding more fertilizer, and so on. Um, and that has other environmental problems as well, uh, running out of water, um, nutrient pollution, and so on. Um, so we need to do this wisely. And in, globally today, we have what I think of as a Goldilocks problem. In some parts of the planet, we are using too much. In term, we are applying, using too much water, we are applying too many nutrients. In other parts of the world, we are not applying enough. And if you, if you we can just magically rebalance nutrient applications around the world. But if you, if you try to do that as analysis, um, and so in this case, all the red places are places where we think nutrient use should be reduced. Um, sorry, all the red places are places we where we could be applying more nitrogen. And that's in Eastern Europe, um, South America, Africa, parts of India. All the places in green, we should be actually de-intensifying agriculture. We should be applying less nitrogen. Um, and if you do that, we estimated that we can actually increase production by about 30% with only a 9% increase in nitrogen. So we can increase the nitrogen use efficiency of our production. So the first three kinds of solutions, halting deforestation, closing yield gaps, and doing it wisely, they're all looking at the supply side. But what about the demand side? Um, if, if, you know, producing food is a, is a task of essentially supplying to meet the demand. On the demand side, we have lots of issues as well. So let's say you are eating, this is a veggie burger, <laughs> in case you can see it. <laughs> uh, let's say you're you know, um, getting that from some crops. Okay? So let's say instead of a veggie burger, you decided to eat a chicken burger. Okay? So that chicken needs to be fed. And if you use the same grains to feed that chicken, you'd roughly need about three times as much grain to feed the same chicken to produce eventually a chicken burger. Now instead, let's say you really wanted to eat a hamburger, right? So to feed the cow, you need roughly 10 times the grain. So this is why eating um, meat-intensive diets are less efficient in terms of resources. So if we ate the grain directly, we would uh, relieve a huge amount of pressure on the land. 
This is a map showing um, how much of the food calories that are produced on the planet are actually used to produce food versus feed, biofuels, and a whole bunch of other things that we use with, with our crops. So think about the Midwestern US, right? The best climate on the planet. Uh, very lucky to have really good soils, really rich soils. Uh, um, I think the Midwestern US produces about 40% of the world's corn, okay? Uh, what is this corn? What, what do we do with this corn? About two thirds of it is fed to animals. About 20% is exported. We don't quite know what happens to it. Uh, another nine to 10% goes to biofuels. Um, then we make high fructose corn syrup. We make cornstarch. Uh, we make uh, beverages. Uh, finally, there's a 2% category that's cereals. So this, we are using this really rich ecosystem, really, you know, we should say we are, we are lucky to have these kinds of agricultural ecosystems around the planet, but we are not really using them to make food. So this graph uh, shows a global analysis and all the places in green are places where people are actually using the food to feed people. So, and in fact, it's places where we grow rice, um, a lot of Southeast Asia, or wheat. Um, all the places in red, are places where we are growing food and using them for other purposes. Mainly maize and soy and crops like that. If, um, for corn, the, the calorie, only 12% of the total corn grown in the world is actually used for um, human calories. If we shift diets, not saying that uh, everyone suddenly needs to become vegan, but shifting diets has a huge impact. We can increase the amount of calories available by 50% by shifting diets. So even small shifts in diet can have huge impacts in the amount of uh, calories that are released. And then finally, there's the issue of food waste. Um, it's estimated, this is not very well known, but it's estimated that about a third of the food that's produced on the planet is wasted. Um, in developing nations, it's pre-consumer waste, so it's uh, it's waste that happens on the field or waste that happens in, um, in storage, in transportation. We, they, most of these poor countries don't have cold storage facilities. Um, so essentially, the, you know, it, 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 it's wasted before it gets to the consumer. The developed world, it's mainly post-consumer waste. It's stuff that happens in our refrigerators, right? We buy the food, we throw it away. Restaurants service huge amounts of, huge quantity of food that we can't finish and so on. But this ha also has a huge leverage and it's getting increasing attention today. Um, there are several experiments around the world. People have found that just taking cafeteria trays away can make a huge difference in, people, in terms of consumption of food because people don't want to, can't carry as much, right? <laughs> so our global challenge really is not just about climate change and food. We have a challenge of feeding the hungry today and those of tomorrow. We have, while reducing agriculture's impact on the global environment, both climate, biodiversity loss, water, and so on, and we have to do all of this while dealing with the climate change problem. I want to take you back to this graph, right? We talked about how agriculture is the foundation of civilizations. Uh, human populations flourished over this 10,000 year time period, um, partly because of fire, but uh, agriculture was one of the foundations of this this uh, dramatic change. Um, those of you who came last year to the series may probably remember this graph. Um, there was, the series was on deep time, and this shows, going back to 100,000 years before present, uh, this is an estimate of how temperatures have changed over the last 100,000 years. And this last 10,000 year period is the one I showed before. This is what we call the Holocene. And you'll notice that uh, during the Holocene, temperatures have been remarkably stable. So they uh, they remain pretty uh, compared to the kind of glacial interglacial cycles we had before. We had a 10,000 year period of remarkable stability. Agriculture was invented right at the beginning of that, and we had you know great civilizations flourishing during that time period. So if we want um, human civilizations to f continue to flourish, um, maybe not in 10,000 years, but at least the next 100, 200 years. Um, it's pretty obvious that human civilizations have been very dependent on a very stable climate, and that very stable climate allowed for agriculture to exist. So if we want human civilizations to continue to flourish in the future, we also need to think about you know, protecting our climate as well as um, so that we can have agriculture as we were lucky to have over the last 10,000 years. 
Thank you. Sure. Everyone can see you. I told Naveen that, that this audience loves uh, graphs, and so <laughs> he took my word for it. So there was a lot of information there. The floor is now open for questions and comments. Who would like to be first? Please. Uh, just one question about production of fertilizers. Is there any concern about, we need a lot of fertilizers to produce the foods now. Is there any issues with uh, materials to produce fertilizers over the long term? So does everyone in the back hear that uh, question? So uh, do I don't have to repeat them then? Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, but not with nitrogen. There's plenty of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, and with the harbor Bosch process, which is quite energy intensive, uh, we can produce nitrogen. There's, uh, I still don't have the, a good number on how much of the global energy is used for nitrogen production, but uh, one estimate I read said it's only 4%. So yes, uh, fertilizer production through Harbor Brush is energy intensive, but food is pretty critical. So if you, if you have an energy problem, I think hopefully we'll prioritize food. Um, having said that, the, the other main nutrient we need is phosphorus. And um, the three big nutrients that plants need, they also need a lot of um, other micronutrients, but the three big ones are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And that's usually what a fertilizer package is composed of. So if you buy fertilizer for your crops, you'll see NPK ratios in there, right? Phosphorus is uh, available, uh, it, as, phosphorus is mined, essentially. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's in rocks. And it's uh, found in only a very few parts of the world. Morocco seems to be sitting on the last kind of big um, amount of phosphorus rock. So recently, there's been a huge amount of debate on whether we are going to run out of phosphorus. There's some people who think we'll run out of phosphorus in 100 years and others who think um, you know, th there's plenty of phosphorus. Because it's just like with oil, with the peak oil kind of debate, uh, it's hard to estimate how much phosphorus is really out there. Uh, but I think the big thing people are worrying about now is phosphorus and not nitrogen. Yeah. So oh, that one is, wasn't with a mic, so the question was um, whether you can comment on topsoil loss, current, and predictions. Uh, I don't have a really good sense of that. Um, I'll just say what I know. And uh, so th there's been a huge amount of worry about uh, uh, soil erosion, um, soil degradation around the planet. Uh, so one est by one estimate, about a third of the world's soils were already degraded. Uh, but since then, a whole bunch of studies have criticized uh, that original kind of global estimate. Um, so yes, we know that soils can get degraded. We know about the Dust Bowl. Um, but when people looked at what ha was, in, so people had estimated that Sub-Saharan Africa was seeing desertification, for example, because of, uh, of cultivation. Uh, but in the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so, uh, it's, things have gotten a lot better, mainly because of rainfall having come back. So the that desertification that people worried about in Africa happened during a 30-year prolonged drought in Africa. And when the rain has come back, um, the soil seems to have come back. So this, um, this issue of soil degradation is pretty tricky. Um, it's uh, different people view it differently. Um, so I'm still not sure whether that's a big issue or not. Right, so that you referred to that just briefly, is that can we, what can we do with modern uh, genetic and genomic techniques to increase yield? Yes, um, this is a tricky one to answer because I, every, this is an issue people are passionate about, as you know. Um, I think maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe it's feeding, feeding back through there, yeah. Um, I think the, 
I'm on the fence about genomics, so let me just say that. Um, I, I think, actually, let's, let me back up and say, the way we've been producing food over the last 40 years, we talked about the green revolution, right? So there's been plant breeding happening. And how does that plant breeding happen? We generally think about it as uh, farmers standing in the field and selecting for crops and you know, people in test tubes. But a lot of the plant breeding depends on mutations occurring in these crops. And it's only in the last, I think, five years when someone told me that a lot of this mutation is actually um, it's created through heating uh, germplasm with radiation, right? So in fact, we've done far worse things than maybe genetic modification, and we haven't worried about it. So there's now a huge amount of attention on GMOs, and I think there are two aspects that worry me, worry me about GMs. One is uh, who controls it, uh, whether it's, uh, how, who's, is it very well tested, the power lies with the big companies. Um, Monsanto has been, you know, you know, terrible at not only PR, but uh, just the way they've dealt with a lot of things. Um, the second thing I, I, I wonder is whether GM is needed um, to address the problems we have. Um, can, can't, can't we solve these problems? I mean, if the, the message you often hear is that the GM is the solution to all of these problems. I think there are lots of other solutions out there as well. Um, so I think GM has potentially a role to play, uh, but I'm not convinced it's needed. So put it that way. <laughs> it's just like saying, do you need nuclear power, right? Um, I think at some point, if uh, you know, James Lovelock, who's uh, known for the Gaia hypothesis, like he's finally, he flipped in a few years ago and started supporting nuclear power because he thinks it's really needed to address the climate change problem. So in a similar way, I think uh, I'm not convinced yet that GM is needed. I'll leave right. it there. It can be a long discussion, the whole talk. <laughs> right yeah. at the back, there's a question, yeah. So, so you're saying, are there any demand level incentives? Yeah, Can you clarify what that is? Right, so how, how can we deal with uh, on the yeah. demand side? In a practical way, I guess, is what you're saying, right? What yeah. could governments do to make us eat healthier? <laughs> Change the food pyramid. <laughs> Change the food pyramid. Uh, there was a paper last year where people said we should start putting a price on meat. Um, I think people respond to price. Uh, when I was growing up uh, in India, we, didn't need, we ate meat on very special occasions when we had relatives visiting or somebody had a birthday. And it's not because we didn't like eating meat, um, it's because we couldn't afford to eat meat that frequently. Right? And so I, I think we are seeing a huge meat transition, or people call it the livestock tr uh, transition in South and Southeast Asia. That's mainly because people are getting more wealthy and they prefer meat-intensive diets. Um, I, so I think price has a lot to do with it. If we, obviously meat consumption has a lot of externalities and uh, an economist would say if you price those externalities, the problem should go away, right? Um, I think education has a lot to do with it as well, information. Uh, a lot of people in North America are reducing their meat consumption because they're, they're worried about uh, environmental problems but also worried about health consequences as well. Um, I think health actually has probably the biggest impact on reduction in, in beef consumption, especially. Um, on the waste side, I think it's the same thing. It's uh, the reason we waste so much food in North America is because it's so cheap. We spend such a small fraction of our incomes on, on food. Uh, while in, in um, developing countries, they spend up to you know, 70 to 80% of their income goes into food, uh, buying food. So they treat it more. <laughs> Carefully, and these are places where they don't even have refrigerators, right? We have refrigerators, and we still waste our food. Other than that, I think. Uh, yes, sir. Um, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, have studies been done on uh, pesticide use and, and cancer in the past 50 years? Or so? Oh, yeah. so. Oh, so the question is: so you've been talking about the intensification and, and the green revolution, and pesticides have played a major role in increasing that production. What's the latest on pesticides and health, human health? Yeah, um, I 
I don't have a good answer to that. I haven't followed the literature very much. Uh, what I have, what I have heard is that the biggest problem is with the uh, is with the uh, the health of the farm workers themselves, and not with the consumers uh, with pesticide use. So. It's, it's a hard one, but essentially, if once you wash your fruits and vegetables, it's very hard to find uh, pesticide residues that are over the prescribed limits. I mean, you, I think with the organic food, there is no pesticide application, so you don't find anything. Uh, but once you wash your fruits and veggies, uh, there's no evidence that there's you know, a substantial amount of pesticides. So for the consumer, it's less of a problem. The producer, the farm workers, it's a huge problem. Is there possible that there are any environmental problems? Or like in the pesticides, you wash it, but then it goes into the water yeah. stream. So are then there any environmental? Yeah. Um, has anyone suggested that there are sort of environmental level problems? Endocrine disruption, and yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's an aquatic ecologist here, but uh, there, there's been, uh, there have been people who, somebody there? No. <laughs> sure, yeah. So there's a concern about the, uh, the, the reduction of the bee population is potentially related to pesticide use. So can I just ask, can we get to this question? Can I just ask a question? So um, was the Green Revolution, how much did pesticides play in that increase in yield? Was it a major player or was it more about yield itself from the breeding? It, um, there is no analysis of that that I know of as to how much it contributed, yeah. It's, it's a multivariate problem because a lot of things have been changing, yeah. Change, things yeah. change at the same time. Yeah. That's yeah. always wondered about that. So, sure, at the back. Earlier in your talk, you were demonstrating that you were saying, I've got a Right. So the question was, you showed this huge drop in, in wheat production in Russia, and you ascribed it to climate. Is it possible that it was due to other things that were happening in Russia at the time? Yeah. Um, with statistical models, there's always the problem of, uh, you know, what's called om omitted variable bias. So basically, you have other things you haven't looked at, right? So the statistical models are looking at temperature and rainfall and it, how it varied with climate. But maybe something else is the real cause. Like, we, we always say correlation is not causation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the way I draw conclusions about this is to say that many people have looked at it in different ways. They've used statistical models to look at it. They've used process-based models to look at it. And you have a kind of a, a conclusion that's fairly robust in the sense that different ways of looking at it have yielded similar results qualitatively. Maybe the quantitative numbers have shifted. Um, and so, you know, there is a reason to believe that, um, you know, if, if rainfall decreases and temperature increases, meat, wheat production would uh, suffer. And so, and yeah, but uh, you, your point is right. I mean, I think all not, we can attribute all of the wheat, uh, we, uh, that statistical model did not explain 100% of the variance in, you know, yield changes around the last 100 years, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go down here so I can hear it. Right. So, right. So, I've heard this as well. So, is it true that the food we eat today is less nutritious than the food we ate 40 years ago because of the, this intensification? Like five, five today apples equals one yesterday apple. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how to address that. I haven't seen the liter literature showing that. Um, lit I, I mean. There's many reasons why food is less nutritious or less tasty. Uh, it, it might be because of soil degradation, it might be because fruits are picked too early and then transported over large distances. Um, so I think figuring out what's causing that is a challenge. There was a fairly controversial study in, from Stanford recently that compared, that looked at nutrition between organic and conventional produce, and they reported that they found 
little difference. I know that's been controversial because others have uh, written back in. But anyway, the funny thing is they didn't actually look at pesticide residues at all. And like they didn't think of that as a nutrition problem. <laughs> so they looked at like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and things like that. Um, it's still something that I don't know a lot about, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> good, good point. Here and then there at the back. Yeah. Uh, what, in your view, view, is the place of organic farming methods in dealing with these challenges of food yields? So, so the question is, where does the organic food industry fit into this? Yeah. That's a great question, especially here in Vancouver. <laughs> and I'm going to give a controversial answer. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just start by saying one of my PhD students and I published a controversial paper on organic. Uh, and so it's only part of the picture. She's still finishing her PhD. But um, so we looked at the, so the, the first thing you hear about organic, so there's pro-organic and anti-organic people, let's say, generally speaking. The first criticism you hear from the anti-organic people is to say organic food is great, but it has much lower yields. So, um, you know, it needs much more area to grow the same amount of food. So you're actually going to cause more environmental problems because you're going to cause deforestation. Um, it, the Economist had an article about food. It had two sentences saying this, and then it moved on from organic, right? So that's a typical dismissal. But nobody had actually looked very carefully at how different are the yields of organic versus conventional produce. And so we did a study, uh, a, what we call a meta-analysis of uh, organic versus conventional yields um, for many different crops, about 300 different observations. Um, another paper has countered our study, but only partly. Um, so let me just say that we found on average that organic yields are lower than conventional yields by 25%. The new study found it was only 20%, but 20 versus 25% difference. So uh, the other thing we found in our study is that the organic conventional yields are different for different kinds of systems. So the yield gaps between organic and conventional are much closer for perennial crops, um, things like fruit trees, um, as well as legumes, um, like soybean, let's say. Um, the yield gaps are much closer also for rain-fed agriculture compared to irrigated agriculture. Um, so in irrigated agriculture, you dump a whole bunch of uh, you know, water, crops do well, but in rain-fed systems, organic, which focuses on soil health, does much better. Um, and so we identified a whole bunch of conditions under which organic performs relatively well compared to conventional. So my view is that it's not, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all one size kinds of solution. Um, I think conventional agriculture, I think there's a lot of things that are bad about conventional agriculture, but a lot of those bad things are enough few practices in a few places. So growing, I think we should distinguish between growing corn and soy versus growing wheat and rice um, in conventional agriculture. So, um, similarly, we should distinguish between you know, intensive agriculture production in Iowa versus maybe less intensive agriculture production elsewhere. So instead of framing the whole debate as conventional versus organic, I think we should focus on where the problems are and try to alleviate them and organic farming principles have a lot to offer. I mean, I think conventional agriculture has a lot to learn uh, in terms of farming with crop rotations, with uh, having more diverse crops and so on. So I, I'd like to kind of take the debate away from this polarized organic or not. Um, so that's my, that's my, what I think. <laughs> hmm. Do you need if, to feel guilty if you buy organic food? If you food? buy organic food? <laughs> Just a little uh, bit guilty. Twenty percent guilty. I don't waste a single morsel. That's a good. Okay, so there's a question here. Yeah. Hi, I was wondering where do you see the local Where do I see the, the local? local BC food system? He only moved here in September. In yeah, August, I know. Right? I know. <laughs> that was going to be my answer. <laughs> Oh, I see. The crop yield. So, will will crops will BC, Are you asking whether BC will do better in the next with climate change? Right. So, you said that some places will do better, some places may do worse. So, do you know anything about the projections here and the I, rain and all I that? I haven't looked at. I mean, this is something I want to do. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Uh, I don't. I, nobody I know has done the work in Canada. 
one of the really funny things I've <laughs> so one of part of my work which I didn't talk a lot about is I collect data. I collect tons of data and I work with data. Um, so part of the work we've done with all this yield gap work has been our ability to collect crop yield data from around the world. Um, so um, you know, India, China, uh, US, and Brazil, and so on. We are able to collect uh, data on, on crop yields by county, municipios, um, like the finest resolution. For Canada, surprisingly, the only yield data we have seems to be at the state level, pro provincial data, which is not good enough for to do the kind of analysis I was talking about. And I have no idea why. Um, some of my students have talked to people in Agri Agriculture Canada, and they can't. I mean, we should have better yield data than provincial level averages. So anyway, the, so it's challenging to do it. There have been some crop modeling studies, but uh, I, do, I don't think there are enough studies to make a definitive conclusion about Canada. Yes, right at the back, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how good is our forecast? How good can our forecasting be, given the lag times, for instance, between CO2 going up and temperature going up? And so, how confident are you in making projections? You, you were you were presenting projections from 2070 to 2090, but those are confident projections or conservative projections or <laughs> they are projections. I think that's all we can say. Uh, you know, if you look at the IPCC report, uh, they have. I don't think I have a graph. Oh, and I do. Oh, yeah. Oops. So, you know, in the, in the IPCC report, these are all different projections by different people, right? And so that's 194 studies and 127 studies. And you can see a huge amount of scatter. <laughs> There's a line there, but... <laughs> So, I, <laughs> so that's how confident we are in some sense. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you're absolutely right because there's also countervailing forces. Like in one, sense, in one hand, CO2 is beneficial, temperature is not beneficial. So some studies here have included CO2, some have not. Uh, so the way, way different people study it um, uh, makes a difference. Right now, there is this, um, oh yeah, I didn't uh, talk about that. So there is actually an ongoing uh, project called the Agricultural Model Intercomparison Project. So what they decided was to say, okay, all these people are doing all these models. Can we get these uh, models to do similar kinds of experiments and rather than all doing their own thing? Um, the major conclusion I've seen from that experiment is that are so when you do these experiments you have to do some different things you, have, you use different models to do the experiments but you're also looking at potential futures right you 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 have you have to think about what the future scenario would be so you, are we going to continue emissions as we are today are we going to reduce emissions i mean us and china just decided that you know agreed that they will reduce emissions so we have scenarios on what the future might look like and this is what, you know, I, in one of my graphs, I had four different categories, A1, B1. Those are all different scenarios and what scientists think the future could look like. So this model comparison project found that the differences between different models is greater than the differences between the future scenarios. So basically, there's a huge uncertainty in the models themselves. Like, we still need to do a lot of work. The, let's... Let's uh, make an, look at an analogy. Um, climate models now, um, there are a whole bunch of climate models, but they are getting better and better over time. But climate modeling has been around for 30 years, maybe 40 years. Right? So there's a long history of climate modeling. 
crop modeling is fairly recent. So, you know, it's uh, only in the, maybe in the last 10 years that we have, we've been doing this. So we still have a long way to go and to be able to do the kinds of projections that climate models are able to do. And doing the models that are required, I guess. I have a very basic question, and that is, who is going to grow our food in the future? Because the average age of a farmer in Canada is late 50s, if not early 60s now. And I ask my students, does anyone want to farm? And very, very few put up their hands. Um, it's not a choice of livelihood these days for anyone. It's becoming much more commodified, and food is a, is a big business and a global business. So I worry about who will be growing food other than corporations. And uh, if an area is short of food, are they going to look after themselves first? And what will happen with the global distribution of food? So. Yeah, this is a question. You want to repeat it? <laughs> this is a question I struggle with. I just came across a book. This a guy called Peter Timmer has a book called The World Without Farmers. And you know, in his perspective, a lot of people talk about this is the trend in the world is people going out of farming. Uh, my grandmother was a farmer too. And um, you know, we just sold the last piece of land a few years ago because no, nobody in my generation wants to farm. Um, it, farming is a hard business. And you know, it, it, I, I, I don't necessarily I don't necessarily mourn the fact that we are losing. I mean, I think farming is increasingly being corporatized, and maybe that's the way it will be, except for a few people who want to do it as a passion. Um, I don't think I want to impose my values on what farming should look like, because I chose to do it, not to do it myself. Um, this question came up at, in a, during a discussion at McGill, uh, I'm sorry, UBC. I still talk about McGill. <laughs> Uh, at UBC, there was a uh, seminar on food, and uh, this question came up, and a student asked the question, so, you know, f maybe 10, 20 years ago, we used to have a lot of small shoemakers, people, you know, they were people who used to make your shoes, and we don't do that anymore, but we don't sit around and lament uh, the loss of small shoemakers. We are fine that Reebok and Nike is making our shoes. Um, so why do we have... Uh, different value with food, and I think it's because we all personally connect to food, and we, you know, value the idea of farmers growing our food, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, the only way I think we can do it is by supporting what we want to see on the landscape. So if we feel like we want organic food and we want it to come from farmers that we know, we need to be able to put our money where the mouth is and pay for it. But unfortunately, not everyone on the planet is able to do that. So. The, the big challenge is, uh, always comes down to the price of food. If you want, uh, you know, people in the world are, uh, there's 800 million people on the planet who are hungry. If we want to feed them, people say the best thing we can do is either alleviate poverty or make the price of food cheaper. So uh, I, I think we should put more focus on alleviating poverty than making food cheaper. But anyway, the, the, the point is that if food prices go up, um, those people, there will be more people who can afford to buy food, um, especially the urban poor. Um, on the other hand, I think if you want to farm the way we want, which is uh, more ecologically friendly, supporting you know, small-scale agriculture and so on, the price of food will necessarily have to be higher. Uh, so I always think that people who can afford it and want to value that should, and others, but we shouldn't impose that as a universal solution. Here, and then there again, yeah. Okay, um, just a quick question. Um, are you aware of anywhere in the wasteful global north that sets a standard of wasting, wasting a, a little amount of food or less than we do? And do you have any concrete, concrete ideas on how, how to stop wasting so much food? Right, so can we point to anybody in the west, that, any places in the west that does a better job than we do? That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't, and maybe that should be something to be looked at. Is uh, are there good role models out there uh, for how how to waste less? I think it's a good question. I don't know if any. <laughs> but would the data be available? Like, is it easy? You said there are poor data on yields. Are there yeah. data on waste? No, food waste data are much worse. Even worse. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, that's an issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go collect it ourselves. Um, can and then here, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to come back to the phosphorus question. Uh, everything I've read of late says that uh, you know, there's very few new phosphate deposits being found. Those that there are have too much heavy metals in them. The P205 grade and, and the better mines like the Western Sahara have dropped several percent in the last decade or two. And now Western Sahara and Morocco have controlled about 9% of the world's phosphorus. So from a food security point of view, that seems to be essentially the, at the center of it all, which makes me very uncomfortable that feeding 12 billion, I mean, I don't even think if that scenario works out that there would be enough phosphorus to feed 7 billion people. I mean, so unlike oil, where there's other sources of energy, natural gas, whatever, I mean, there's no substitute for phosphorus. That's for Isaac Asimov's book. So I wonder if you explore the phosphorus crunch a little bit, a little bit further. Right. So, we've, so people have heard that there may be a, a phosphorus crunch. So can you expand on that a little yeah. bit more? Especially I'm, I'm, given how concentrated it is. Yeah. I'm not an expert on that, so I can't speak uh, very knowledgeably. Um, other, I, I, I come back to this, that it's, phosphorus is not lost to the planet, right? It's just, it's now in water, it's now in soils. And as you say, it, um, it's, it's fairly dilute in, it, in the current form, so getting it back out is really challenging. Um, and it'll cost a lot of money. So. But if phosphorus becomes a really, really valuable crop, it'll, and if the price of food becomes high enough at that point, um, we will recycle phosphorus uh, better than we do today. Um, and that'll be expensive, but that's, that's the way it is. Um, I, I was uh, in an interesting workshop, um, what five or some, some, sometime within the last decade, I can't remember anymore. But anyway, it was a workshop that had people from the f uh, food, from a kind of land side, water side, energy side and uh, materials side. So it was a workshop on sustainable development or something. And so they brought these communities together to talk about how they think about the problems and whether there are any um, interactions between them. So it was really funny because we sat in each other's uh, sessions. And uh, what was really remarkable was that the materials people, so people were thinking about whether we're going to run out of gold, whether we're going to run out of, you know, okay, maybe gold doesn't matter as much from a need perspective, but whether we're going to run out of vital uh, metals that we uh, you know, use for silicon chips and things like that. Um, they are really focused on recycling, right? Um, that's, uh, and because these minerals are valuable enough, there's a whole industry that focuses on recycling. Outside of Bangalore, apparently, there's this whole, you know, little city where people take old transistors and, I mean, it, it's very toxic stuff, but there are people who essentially dismantle them to get the, the metals out. Um, so my sense is that at some point, we'll have to start recycling phosphorus. Um, other, yeah, I agree with you that we are probably not going to find too many new sources, but... Looking into the future, IBM is heavily involved in big data crunching for farms, which means all the climate data, all the soil data, and everything else. And they use drones to monitor the crop production during the season. How much do you think this will help at least the North American food production? Yeah, you don't have to repeat that. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, yes. I think it it will help in the sense of this is a kind of agriculture that people call precision agriculture, where we say we have to we can uh, we need to optimize our production system in a way that you know uses the most uses water and nutrients most efficiently. So there, these are systems that can predict how weather patterns might change. Uh, using satellites to map uh, the, the quality of soils and map uh, the amount of soil moisture. And so, you know, a farmer can, you know, use computational systems to apply just the right amount of fertilizer in particular parts of the farm. I mean, it, it's great. And, and I, 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 I agree that we should be more resource use efficient. But I also think that we are still producing more and more corn, right? We are still using this to, so that the, the we have to start questioning the basis of North American agriculture in the first place. That's my sense. So, yes, we should do things better, but maybe we shouldn't be doing some things at all. So. 
That's right. You, you can't have too much corn. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Right. This is a very good question. So how much unused cropland or farmland is there still? And, and is the question how much is there going to be as we go north? How far could we go north? Yeah. Yeah. As it warms up. I, I did an estimate uh, about 10 years ago, and other people have done it. And we've, most people find the same rough number, which is we maybe have another, uh, you know, we can double the amount of land in production. Um, but all of that land is in the tropics under rainforest, right? And so, yeah. So it's the opportunity cost. Like, do we really want to do that? Um, same thing in the, in the, I think my estimate also showed that as climate warms, uh, we will have more agriculture, more uh, suitable agricultural land in Canada and Siberia uh, because of warmer climate. But the, the, it's a soils question is very hard. Um, a lot of the soils are not necessarily suitable for agriculture, so. So we don't know about the north, basically, because of yeah, the soil. Because of the yeah. soil question, we yeah. don't know. And it, any other? Yes, Jen. Um, is there any indication that uh, pest presence is going to increase with climate change? More insect pests or right. pathogens? So you, yes, you, you alluded to that in the IPC report. IPCC the IPCC report, report uh, concluded that weeds will become more competitive with climate change. Um, I don't think they talked about pests, but I didn't, haven't, I didn't read that. So we don't know. Uh, I think I don't know, but maybe there are people who know. <laughs> but it's an important question. It's an important question, yeah. Because they can reproduce faster when it's warmer and all those, that yeah. as well. Yes, sir, another one. Uh, just one other question. I was wondering what are your thoughts on urban agriculture? Is it viable to actually supplement any part of the traditional agriculture system with urban agriculture? what's the word? Urban agriculture. Urban ag oh, yes. What's the role of urban agriculture in all this? I'm going to give a controversial answer again. <laughs> uh, I, I, okay, I, I did a study recently saying that, okay, so let me back up and say, I think urban agriculture has a role and potentially important role in producing certain kinds of food um, um, that we need. But uh, I showed you a map of uh, the world's agricultural land, right? Um, so the amount of urban area, we, so there's about 12% of the world's uh, land area is in croplands, places we grow crops. Uh, the amount of urban area we have is roughly half a percent. So there's no way we can replace the production on 12% of the land onto half a percent of the land. Even if you, this is assuming all of the urban area is taken up by crops, right? No more, we can't live there. Um, so then people say, okay, maybe vertical farming, right? We can have stack up our crops into big high story buildings. That takes energy. Um, it's, 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 I, th I think these are, there are innovative things people are trying, but you know, I, I read about this high-tech solution where they were talking about how they have to get the basil leaves closer to the window, and so they had these, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, certain systems so the basil leaves are, the basil plants are uh, sequentially moved closer to the window and further back out. All of this stuff takes energy, so I think ultimately it makes food more expensive. So. If we want cheap, I think it's a problem of wanting cheap food, uh, wanting uh, you know to to do it with very low energy. That's that's just not possible. The best energy, the best form of agriculture we have today harnesses sunlight and does it outside. Uh, it's the high value crops that we grow inside, like marijuana, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so. And that's but not, joking that's not aside, I think I, I, I think there's a there's a I mean if you look at what urban agriculture happens today, it's mostly vegetables. So a lot of people say, yeah, we are feeding. You know, there was a farm in uh, Montreal that said uh, we feed 3,000 people, um, you know, during a year or something like that. That was their advertisement. So, but we, when we asked for their data, they were unwilling to share, and they're feeding 3,000 people vegetables during part of the growing season. Right. Um, the urban agriculture doesn't produce uh, grain. Uh, we don't grow rice and wheat in urban agriculture. So. so I think it has a role to play, but uh, as with the food problem, I think everything, we, we need to be thinking about the right solution in the right places. Um, it, we can't, it can't be just like organic or GM. I think we need to be thinking about 
you know, a mix of different solutions. Any other? Yes, sir. Sorry, maybe I missed this on some of the models and everything, but how much of like, a, so if you went with that, there's going to be a population of 9 billion in 2050, how much like just meat reduction, just reducing, like reallocating um, sort of um, like food sources and just changing it to grains and whatnot? 